Chapter 20, The Ringing Cedars of Russia. I decided to go back to my apartment. Moscow was already feeling the touch of spring. All that remained in the kitchen was a half a bottle of sunflower seed oil and some sugar. I needed to replenish my larder and decided to sell my winter shapka, which was made of mink. It was a real mink hat, not imitation, and it cost a great deal. Of course, the winter weather was almost over now, but I thought I might get at least something for it. So I headed for one of Moscow's many outdoor markets. I went up to various merchants selling fruit and other goods. They looked at the shopka, but were in no hurry to buy it. I had already decided to lower the price when two men approached me. They turned the shopka over in their hands, feeling the fur. Quote, I need to try it on. Go see if you can borrow a mirror somewhere, one of them said to his companion, and suggested I follow him off to one side. We reached a secluded spot at the end of a row of stalls and stopped to wait for his companion with the mirror. We didn't have to wait long. He crept up stealthily from behind, and the blow on the back of my head first caused me to see stars, then my whole vision went blurry. I managed to grab hold of a fence to stop myself from falling to the ground, but when I came to, my buyers were nowhere to be seen. The shopka, too, was gone. Only a couple of women were there making sympathetic oohs and ahs. Are you okay? Awful bastards. Here's a crate. You can sit down for a bit. I stayed standing against the fence for a while longer and then slowly made my way out of the market area. A spring drizzle was falling. I was about to cross a street and stopped on the curb to look both ways. There was a painful ringing in my head. I wasn't watching, and a passing car sprayed me with water from a puddle thoroughly wetting my trousers and windbreaker. I was trying to figure out what to do next when a truck whizzed by, covering me with more spray from the same puddle, and this time the spray flew right into my face. I stepped back from the curb and took refuge from the rain under the awning of one of the commercial kiosks and tried to think my next plan of action. There was no way I realized that I could get into a metro station looking like this. It was three stops to my apartment. Sure, I could walk it, but the way I looked, I might get picked up by the police thinking I was a drunk or a tramp or just a suspicious person. Then you stand there trying to explain and justify yourself while they investigate your case. What could I tell them anyway? Who am I now? And then I saw this man. He was sh shuffling slowly down the sidewalk, carrying two cases of empty bottles. He looked like one of those tramps or boozers who often circulate among kiosks that sell spirits on tap. Our eyes met. He stopped, put down his cases on the sidewalk, and struck up a conversation with me. Quote, what are you looking at? This is my territory. On your way, he said quietly, though not without an air of authority. Not wanting to argue with him or cross him, indeed, not having the strength to do so, I replied, I don't need your territory. I'll just gather myself together and leave. But he continued, and where will you go? None of your business where I'm going. I'll just leave. That's it. And will you make it? I'll make it if I'm not interfered with. Leave me alone. The way you look, you won't either stand very long or walk very far. What's that to you? You haven't got a home to go to? What? A novice, A. Eh? Okay, wait here for a moment. He picked up his cases and walked off. He came back a moment later with a wrapped parcel and again started speaking to me. Follow me. Where are we going? 
to a place where you can rest for a couple of hours or maybe till morning. You can get yourself dried out, then you can proceed on your way. Following after him, I asked, is your apartment close by? Without turning his head, he responded, you couldn't get to my apartment if you walked your whole life long. I don't have any apartment. I have my deploy deployment quarters. We walked up to a door leading to the basement of a multi-story block of flats. He told me to stand over on one side while he looked around, waiting until none of the tenants were to be seen, then struck something that looked like a key in the lock and opened the door. It was warmer in the basement than on the street. Heat came from hot water pipes, which had been deliberately stripped of their insulation, probably by tramps. On the floor in one corner stood a pile of rags illuminated by a dim light filtering in through a dust-covered basement window. But we went on past them into a far corner which stood empty. He unwrapped the parcel and brought out a bottle of mineral water and uncapped it. Taking a swallow in his mouth, he sprayed it all around as though from an atomizer. That's to keep the dust down, he explained. Then he slightly moved a divider standing in the corner to one side. From the narrow space between the divider and the wall, he took out two sheets of plywood covered with plastic, along with several pieces of plastic covered cardboard. He used them to lay out two makeshift bunks on the floor Taking an old food tin from the corner, he lit the candle it was holding. The lid of the tin was not completely detached. It was clean and bent slightly upward in a semicircle to serve as a reflector. This primitive device illuminated the edge of the bunks and the half meter of space between them. Here he spread out a sheet of newspaper on which he started laying the contents of the parcel, cheese, bread, and two packages of kefir. Neatly slicing the cheese, he issued an invitation. What are you standing for? Come on, sit down, take off your jacket, hang it over the pipe. When it dries out, we'll clean it. I've got a brush. Your trousers will dry out without taking them off. Try not to wrinkle them. Then he brought out two drams of vodka, and we sat down to eat. In contrast to the dirty basement floor all around us, the corner my companion had managed to set up for himself had an air of cleanliness and coziness. After we clinked glasses, he introduced himself. Call me Ivan. Nobody here bothers with my last name. The way he improvised the bunks and set out the food on the newspaper, despite the dirty floor, created a clean and cozy atmosphere in his basement corner. I don't suppose you have anything softer to lie on, I asked after supper. Quote, you can't even keep rags down here. They only get dirty and then they start to smell. I've got neighbors over in that corner, two of them. They show up from time to time. They've made one hell of a dirty mess. We got involved in conversation. I started answering his questions and in doing so, I ended up inadvertently telling him about my meeting with Anastasia her lifestyle and her abilities, about her ray, her dreams and aspirations. He was the first person I had talked with about Anastasia. I myself don't know why I told him about all her eccentricities, about her dream and how I promised to help her. I had indeed tried to set up a fellowship of pure-minded entrepreneurs, but had made a major mistake. I should have written the book first. Now I'll set about writing one and try to get it published, I affirmed. Anastasia said the book would be needed first. Quote, 
Are you really confident you can write it and get it published without any funds? I don't know whether I'm confident or not, but I shall certainly work in that direction. That means you have a goal and you're going to go for it. Quote, I'm going to try. Quote, and you're sure you'll make it? Quote, I'm going to try.